Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Finding Your Paradise webinar. It's basically the frequently asked questions that everybody has about living, working, retiring, or investing in Mexico. And, you know, if you've seen other webinars in our series, this is the original. I started this as an evening weekly workshop in our office, and it eventually moved online. But it really came out of all of the questions I answer from people each and every week. You know, when you think about in making an investment in Mexico, whether it's a business, whether it's purchasing a property, whether it's, you know, thinking about spending extended time there, there are all these questions that you have about, you know, just living in Mexico in general that you kind of have to sort through before you can even get to the stage of thinking of, you know, renting a place or buying a place or jumping into a company. And so, you know, I just, this is, this is an amalgamation of all of those questions that people had. We updated each year. This is obviously the 2020 version, but um, we're certainly happy to answer any questions that you have. And we hope this goes a long way to answering the questions that you do have. If we haven't met before, hi, this is me. My name's Amber Pierce. I'm originally from Michigan and a graduate of Michigan State University. I'm a loyal Spartan. I have two boys. They're currently 11 and 16. If you know them, you're not going to leave this. They're each going to turn 12 and 17 this year, um, which is crazy. Time flies. I began visiting Puerto Morales in 1998 and moved there full time in 2004. And I am the broker and owner of a company called Mayan Rivera Properties. And you know, over time, um, I got into real estate kind of on the back end of things. Uh, I was involved in, I've been involved in buying and selling real estate, building projects, uh, remodeling, residential and commercial construction. Uh, I've, you know, been a landlord. I've had landlords in Mexico. You'll see in a moment, our, our company does property management, condominium association management. So, I hope that all of those experiences between living in Mexico, having kids in Mexico, all the things that life brings over that amount of time, and then professionally speaking, sort of all dumps into this webinar. And I just hope to be able to share my expertise and experience with you and certainly answer any questions that you have. This is my company, Mayan Rivera Properties. I started it in 2006, and we do three things. Uh, we specialize in Puerto Morales, Mexico, which is in the Riviera Maya, just south of Cancun. We do real estate sales, vacation rentals, and property management, which also includes condominium association management. I have two different federal certifications in Mexico. I'm federally certified to sell real estate as well as sell it in its tourist zones. And then our state of Quintana Roo also has a licensing requirement. So I'm also licensed by the state of Quintana Roo to sell real estate. And I'm a member of two organizations. I'm a member of AMPI, A-M-P-I, which is that green logo over there. That's the Mexican Association of Realtors. And then I'm also an international member of NAR, which is the blue realtor R that some of you might be familiar with and seeing. That's the National Association of Realtors in the United States. And I'm an international member of that organization. Just for reference, this is Laura Zapata. You can put a face with a name. She's originally from Texas, and she's been living in New Mexico longer than I have. She moved down in 1996 and has held various positions within AMPI, uh, including president. Right now, she's in the Honor and Justice Committee. She's a buyer agent at Mayan Rivera Properties, and I always include her. Not She's not on the webinar today, but just because if you contact our office about sales, you're going to reach either myself or Laura, and let's just kind of put a face with a name. But between the two of us, we've been selling real estate for over 40 years. And so, again, we just hope that that experience really comes through in what we do, and we're happy to share our experiences with you. So today in this webinar, we're going to cover lots of things. Uh, it's really a pretty broad um a broad spectrum of topics, but it covers a lot of the common questions people have. We're going to go over basic uh, Mexico's basic investment picture. Where is the Mayan Riviera? Why I chose Puerto Morelos? Um, you know that topic. You know if you, I'm not trying to sell Puerto Morelos as a specific destination. This webinar is for somebody that's interested in any area of Mexico. But I specifically moved to Mexico and chose a place and. You know, sometimes just getting started is daunting because people have to really narrow down what places to look at. And so I can tell you what attracted me to Puerto Morelos and the factors I considered. And, you know, everybody's different and those may not be the factors that you choose, but I hope it helps you kind of work through what your options are. 
what are costs of living? Do I need a visa? Can I open a bank account? Can I work in Mexico? Can I own a vehicle or do I need a driver's license? Health insurance, do I need to speak Spanish? Can I own property in Mexico? And what are the costs of ownership? Those are all things we're gonna go through. So let's get started with Mexico's investment picture. You know, I, I added this to the webinar, um, gosh, it's been a couple of years now, but it's a rather new addition to the workshop. I did it because, you know, if you're thinking of opening a company, if you're thinking of buying a piece of commercial real estate, if you're thinking about buying a piece of residential real estate, it's a major investment. And um, that piece of real estate may have vacation rental income that you're considering. Uh, certainly that business is gonna, you know, you're gonna need to do some research on that. And overall, even if you don't plan to rent, even just buying and selling, knowing and understanding the market, um, understanding who your fellow buyers will be, understanding who your fellow buyers will be when you go to sell as a seller, um, all of those are helpful in understanding um, Mexico's economy and looking at it from an investment perspective. So um, I hope that all of this information kind of sheds some light on that. The other thing is, is that I'm gonna show you the sources I use to get this information and those sources are available online and definitely helpful if you're thinking about getting started in, in Mexico, you can dive into these numbers more and kind of filter down to the areas that you're interested in and certainly provide you with good sources of information. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. What I wanna talk about is Mexico, especially investing um, in its tourist economy, okay? And so let's let's start there. You know, Mexico is a, I'm gonna grab my little pointer here. This goes through Mexico's rank on the international tourism, tourism stage from 2011 to 2018. There's an asterisk there because some of the numbers from 2018 weren't complete yet. And I just pulled, this is uh, April of 2020, I just pulled these offline. So um, this is current information. But what this means is this is the number of tourists that travel into a country. So the number of tourists that have come through Mexico or any of these other countries from another country that have checked, they're there for touristic purposes, okay? Um, and this compares those numbers. So if you look at 2011, Mexico was at number 10 overall. 2012, they were at 13. 2013, they were sitting at number 15. 2014, they jumped to number nine, held at number nine for another year. 2016, up to number eight. 2017, we're up to number six. And 2018, they were sitting at number seven. Okay, so for the last um, last number of years, they've the majority of them, they've been in the top 10 as a destination. The other thing I want you to see is the numbers, okay? Mexico started out in 2011 with 23.4 million tourists. And you'll see that number kind of held here. We see a jump here to 29. What's important to note is look at between, this is a seven year period between 2011, 2018. 2011, they had 23.4 million tourists. In 2018, they have 41.4. And I will tell you that number is even higher in 2019 when we look at just Mexico. And so what does that mean? That means that Mexico over the last period has invested a serious amount of effort and money and infrastructure into their tourism uh, sector of their economy. And Mexico is very serious about tourism and the money that it uh, offers to the Mexican economy. And they continue to promote it as an international destination. They continue to push for new, to open new markets. They continue to get flights brought on board that are direct destinations from new locations. And that is paying off big time for Mexico. It has doubled their numbers of tourists in just in a very short period of time, really. Um, I mean, we're talking about really since 2014, we're talking about a period of two years almost, okay? So, um, but certainly doubling it over the last seven. So let's, um, let's dive into those numbers a little bit further and see kind of what that means for Mexico. Get my slide to move here. There we go. 
So this is, if you, let me just jump back. If you take 2018, okay, this is basically a reflection of 2018. You'll see that um, France actually did come in at 89.4 million people. I don't know if you realize that, but France has the num is the number one international tourist destination. And they, they cruise right up there between, um, in the last 10 years, between 80 and 90 million people a year, which is an outstanding number of people for a relatively small country. Um, but just so that if, in case you're interested, you know, this is France, Spain, the United States, China, Italy, Turkey, Mexico, Germany, Thailand, the UK, Japan, Austria, Greece, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Russia, Portugal, Canada. This is Poland and Holland. Okay. And it really just gives you some perspective on where Mexico sits. In 2008, they were sitting here. Okay. Um, Pretty close to Tur uh, pretty close to Turkey. Turkey always surprises me on this list. I don't know why. You'll see a a, ver a jump into China and Italy's numbers, and then you'll see another jump up into the you know eighty million range between France, the U.S., and Spain. And um, France kind of holds at the top. U.S. and Spain sort of flip flop back and forth. If you check out that other um, slide we were just at, so just kind of gives you an idea of. Um, the range of numbers that are in the top 20 and um, and where Mexico sits and looking that it came from basically where uh, Canada and Portugal are sitting now and has come all the way up here in such a short period of time. Okay, so this, and again, I'll, just to note on the last two slides you had this as well, these are my, um, these are my sources for this information. This particular source, datatour.sector.gov.mx, that is a brand new website for Mexico. If you've seen previous versions of this webinar, we have pulled it from another site. Mexico has put this website together. It has more sources of information. So overall, it's a much more helpful site. I will say that the last version had more functionality to it built in to where you could really drive down to the numbers that you wanted and get really specific. This site doesn't have that yet, though they are working on it and it is coming. So overall, once they're finished with this site, it's gonna be even be a much better source of info than even the ones that we've used in years past. Um, but Mexico itself has its numbers ready for 2019. So you'll see that, um, you know, Mexico, uh, this actually starts in 2010, and 23 million uh, held steady uh, in 2011, kind of held steady these years, and then you start to see it climb. And this is where Mexico really puts in, um, you know, in 2012, 2013 is where Mexico really started to put some programs in place to really start promoting um, expansion and tourism, and this has paid off, okay, over time up to where they're up to 45 million now uh, in 2019. Obviously, in 2020, we're sitting in the middle of the COVID pandemic, and though that's going to affect tourism worldwide, so there's going to be a blip in this growth pattern, but Mexico has set itself up for long-term growth in this sector. So what does that mean as far as dollars? Uh, you know, in 2017, they were sitting at number six. In 2018, they were sitting at number seven with 39.3 and 41.4 million respectively. You'll see sometimes this last number change a little bit because of rounding, but um, but um, over the charts. But anyway, so what does this mean? Well, it translates into several billion dollars. Uh, in 2017, it meant 20, uh, the 39.3 million people, international tourists, meant $21.3 billion in revenue for the country. 41.4 million tourists in 2018 brought in 22.5 million, I'm sorry, $22.5 billion in revenue for Mexico. It's a serious income generator for them. As a matter of fact, this is the most recent data that I could find, but in 2017, tourism was 8.8% of the GDP. And obviously since 2017, it's continued to grow. I've seen some numbers indicating that it looks like it's near 11 to 12% now. Um, so the country profile, this is another source of information called the World Tourism Organization. And the World Tourism Organization has a great website as well. It's very interactive. You can really filter down to see the information that you want. Um, these are the slides about Mexico. The World Tourism Information has information from 2018. 
um, for all the countries. 2019 is still under construction, so you don't see those numbers on there yet. But um, for 2018, as we know, we've already talked about this, you know, 41.3 million people. That was 5% increase over the year prior. Over the past 10 years, it's an average um, growth of 6%. Now, I will tell you that we saw that um, spread really in the last, you know, the first five years of that 10 year period were pretty flat. And then you see this growth kick in. And so that six year average is kind of, um, while it's accurate over an average of 10 years, it's a little bit uh, misleading because now, you know, they've had steady end over end growth well past 6% for the last uh, seven years or so. So, but it does, it does rate out to about 6% overall. Um, $22.5 billion of income, that was a 6% increase over the year before, and that turns out to about 550 US dollars per arrival. Uh, this is sort of interesting. If you're thinking about doing a business or you want to kind of um, have a bellwether on economy, this is a really interesting thing that I track. And anecdotally, I will tell you that this is definitely an indicator of economic health globally. So this says, you know, Mexico sees a pretty good spread of tourists from around the world, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. And this basically shows the number of arrivals and um, the number, the amount of receipts that they bring in, so the amount of money they spend while they're there. And if you see this, um, in the years where there's a greater disparity, these are people not spending as much money on vacation, um, that's a sign of economic weakening. If you see less people going on vacation, that's a more drastic sign of economic weakening. And conversely, if you see them spending more or spending more than the amount of arrivals, that seems to really follow um, economic indicators worldwide. And it's, it's a number that we, we like to look at um, to kind of understand what's going on globally. Mexico, um, again, just a little bit more information. If you dig in on the World Tourism Organization site, you can look at things by region. Mexico happens to be in the region of what they call the Americas, essentially the Western Hemisphere. So it's North and South America. And um, you can compare it by, the, by um, certain countries, you compare it by its region, you compare it by the world. Um, let's note, you know, a lot of this repeats information that we've already talked about. You see it in 2013 and in 2014, numbers really beginning to increase. This is where those programs that they started putting into place really started paying off. And you see the amount of growth, um, huge growth through year here and continuing to grow um, year over year from 2013 forward. Um, another thing that you'll notice is, is that, you know, within its region, how is it performing within its region? It's actually outperforming its regional partners. We talked about Mexico having an average of 6% growth over the last 10 years, and that outperforms other countries in the region that uh, the other average um, of other countries is 4.2%. 4 so Mexico's doing well. So who are these people? You know, if you're gonna open a business, who are your clients? Um, if you're going to buy a house, who are the people you're gonna be bidding against? If you're gonna be selling a house, whose economies matter? Uh, the good news is that Mexico has a pretty broad spectrum of, um, of tourists that come and it makes for overall a pretty strong market for second homes and for business. You know, the U.S. economy might be down, but somebody else's economy is doing well in general. Obviously, with the COVID pandemic, that's a whole new ball game, and everybody's on pause. But generally speaking, over time, 99 years out of 100, it turns out, uh, you're going to have a pretty stable economy. So, um, the U.S. does account. Now, I will say, before I start into this slide, this is international tourists that arrived via air in 2019. And I look at this specifically because there are plenty of United States citizens that go and check tourists on their box and they're going over the border for shopping, um, maybe to go see a dentist, maybe to go visit some family. Um, but I think it skews those numbers, especially when you want to look at businesses and tourism um, and, and real estate investment in tourist areas, which is what most people are looking at when they're talking about moving to Mexico full time. 
if you want to see all of them together, certainly you can go on this site and pull that out. But I think that looking at the tourists that arrive by airplane is a much better indicator if you're looking at a tourist based um, business or investment. So here's your market. Half of them are from the United States, 55%, a little over half. 12% are from Canada. This chunk is growing. Colombia and Brazil weren't even on this map three years ago. This is thanks to those expansion programs and new flights. Um, Brazilians are, are coming into Mexico. Uh, this is the United Kingdom is at 3%. And this other 24%, mostly uh, European countries, um, the European Union. Uh, you don't see very many Asian travelers to Mexico yet, although there is talk that Cancun is working on a nonstop from Hong Kong. Uh, that will definitely change the market uh, significantly once that happens. When do they arrive? Now, this is a um, this is a slide that's taken off that data tour website. I will tell you that you used to be able to filter down per airport, which you can't do yet, and that was really helpful to see. Um, right now, they only have posted uh, seasonal arrivals for the country, and so we'll talk about the trends in this anyway and just talk about the slide. So this is millions of tourists, and overall, as a country, you see that Mexico kind of rides a roller coaster, okay? Um, lowest being in September. I will tell you that when you go to look at your specific area of Mexico that you're interested in, I can t speak to the Riviera Maya, okay? The Riviera Maya is a beach location. Having a beach condo or having a business on the beach is like having a business in a ski town. There is a season for it. It is Christmas through Easter by the most part, okay? That is our high season. There are locations that have more European influence and those that do, you know, France has the month off of August. You'll see more European travelers in, um, in the summertime. If you have those, Port of happens to be primarily in Americans and Canadians. So we mostly see a snowbird crowd. Um, in our region, August and then really September and October are very, very rainy months. And so those are very slow uh, months tourists from a tourist perspective. And then things start sliding back upwards in November, December as it starts getting cold and our snowbirds start coming back. By May, uh, really April, things start tapering off. Easter by May, snowbirds are out and it's pretty quiet. That doesn't actually reflect the typical travel patterns of the whole country. So depending on where you live, um, that's going to matter, and you really want to take a look and understand that from your local sources uh, before you invest in a business or before you um, consider real estate. You know, if you're thinking about buying a home in a beach town and you're planning on wintering in it, but vacation rental income is important, well, those two things are going to compete with each other, right? Because the more time you're in it, the less time you have it available to rent, um, that type of thing. So this is where understanding these markets can be helpful. Okay, so. You know, we talk about these um, 40 million tourists coming in. Where do they go? Well, overwhelmingly, those tourists come to our state of Quintana Roo. Okay, if you take a look in 2019, there were 7.9 million tourists that came into Cancun's airport. And that, the closest to that would be Mexico City at 5 million. Okay, we're nearly double or way over double um, many of the other beach locations. Um, we're, we're um, you know, almost four times the amount uh, of Baja California. Okay, so by and large, uh, this takes the lion's share of the international tourists that come in. Why? Well, this area right here, if you don't know, right here is Cancun and the Riviera Maya is the stretch a beach south of that. The Mayan Riviera in English, Riviera Mayan, Spanish, however you want to say it, stretches from there's Cancun at the north end and Tulum at the south end. And then you have this whole untouched beach, um, most of its biosphere. In this region, if you don't know, is called the um, Costa Maya. It gets quite rural. But the majority of that traffic comes into this little coastline. Why? Okay. For a little bit of perspective, this is Pacific Ocean, this is the Gulf of Mexico, this is the Atlantic, this is Caribbean Sea. This is the only Caribbean shoreline in Mexico. 
So you have that turquoise water and the white sand beaches that are made of um, crushed seashell that don't get hot, no matter how hot it is. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful beaches. And that's really what has built that area, okay? Um, what does that mean? We're gonna talk about this more in a little bit. Cancun is the most um, sought after destination for its beaches. It's the most accessible. What does that mean for a business? That means that, you know, um, you can have a very, very profitable tourist business in this area. It's also the high rent district, right? This is like the Las Vegas, if you will, of Mexico. So property is more expensive in this area. Though we see good returns on investment, um, the rent is higher in this area, though we see higher returns and numbers of tourists. Um, but, you know, if you're looking for something more economical, you might want to start looking for something along the beach that isn't in this area. It's going to be harder to get to. But, um, you know, if you're looking at a retirement destination and budget is a factor, maybe that's um, you start looking at something that's maybe a little further away from the beach in this area or something maybe on the beach in another area that might be feasible for you. So this kind of gives you an idea of. Um, of numbers and certainly if you're looking to make an investment in Mexico understanding um, the numbers of people that come into your airport is important. One of the reasons like I said that make Cancun and the Riviera Maya so attractive is that literally you can get here from almost anywhere and it's a short flight. These are direct flights, non-stop flights to Cancun, okay, from Canada and you'll notice that for Canadians um, four and five hours is a good flight to get to a beach. You're looking at um, quite a bit longer than that to get to Hawaii um, for Canadians. And so they've got to travel a ways anyway to get to a beach. This is good flight times for them. The United States, this is great flight times for us. Um, Detroit, I can tell you right now that most flights get back in three hours and 45 minutes because you get a good headwind, a tailwind, right? And, uh, and so um, to get you back sooner. So look at all the destinations you can get to um, in four hours, right? And even if you're on the West Coast, it's a five hour flight. So, um, so accessible from so many areas, it makes it really even doable for a long weekend from these nonstop flights. And not only from the US and Canada, but this is why you start seeing those pieces of the pie expand in Europe and in South America. You've got not, we have nonstop flights to Moscow. Uh, we've got nonstop flights to Paris. Um, lots of really, really great nonstop, you know, major, major cities in Europe and in um, South America that are adding to the list. You can get to Cancun from almost anywhere direct. These are all the direct flights that come into Cancun. And one of the things that I would say is, um, you know, if you're living in Cancun, the reverse is true. So, you know, living in Cancun is great, but it turns out sometimes you want to go on vacation, although that's another common question I get asked is, where do you vacation, right? Um, so what, what that really means is, is, you know, you can fly out of Cancun to almost anywhere without having to fly to Mexico City to leave. Um, Mexico City would probably be um, the other airport that um, is pretty easy to travel to out of. Um, so Cancun, you know, you can go to Paris five days a week on a nonstop flight. It's pretty great. Now, something to consider, right? If you're looking at an international destination, this is really attractive to a lot of people, the convenience here. But maybe you want to be somewhere more rural um, for budgetary reasons or otherwise. And so um, understanding, you know, this is flights from, take a look at what city you want and look at where you can get to from there right? If you're moving there, that's a really helpful piece of information. Flightsfrom.com, I'll tell you that. A lot of people say, where is the Mayan Riviera, right? Um, I actually, I, I, had, I used to keep track in my office on a chalkboard of the number of people that would comment on the Pacific Ocean, and it would just kill me, right? Because as we talked about, this is the Pacific, this is the entire other side of the country, and people would look at the ocean and not realize where they were at. So let's talk about this so nobody makes that embarrassing mistake. This is Cancun. I live in Puerto Morelos, a little fishing village uh, just south of the Cancun airport. And below that is Playa del Carmen, Puerto Aventuras, Acamal, Tulum. Um, we also have the islands of Cozumel, Cozumel and Isla Mujeres. And this is really what forms 
this coastline here forms the Riviera Maya. You get all this Cien Can uh, biosphere, and then you're right down at the Belize border. Also inland, you can get to Merida, um, which is a colonial city. Um, but you know this serves as a great hub to get to different Mayan sites, old towns, Merida. It's a nice hub for living in. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this area and what made me choose Puerto Morelos, but really um, these are things you have to think about when you're deciding on a location in Mexico. Uh, you know, Puerto Morelos, the draw is the beach for sure, right? Anytime you're in this area, if you're a beach bum, this is the place to be. But other people like other areas of Mexico. You know, Cancun and the Riviera Maya is very, very new. We're just now seeing the kids graduating out of high school and college that are the first generation of Cancun people, right? Everybody is from somewhere else. And because of that, you don't have these old cities steeped in a lot of culture. It's a new baby city. You know, Mexico or Cancun just celebrated its 50th anniversary, right? So, um, so, uh, and, and when I say anniversary, I mean, it was a sand pile 50 years ago. And so, um, in a dream, sand pile in a dream, really. So, um, what does that mean? That means that, you know, if you enjoy the Spanish colonial architecture and the arts and, you know, with the symphonies and, and museums, Mexico offers that in spades. Uh, you can be in Valladolid, a much smaller colonial city in the central, um, Peninsula, you could go to Merida, another very old, very historic city. Um, Campeche is down here, and that is just in our peninsula. Mexico is full of beautiful, historic Spanish colonial cities, and if that is your jam, uh, then take a look at those. You know, I like the hot climate. I like living in the rainforest, but Mexico truly varies in its climate from rainforest, tropical rainforest to desert to mountains, right? And everything in between. So take a look at what type of landscape you like, what kind of, um, you know, flight availability you need uh, either to, to get from where you live or if you live here full time to go where you want to go. If you're a world traveler, you might not want to be so far from international airport. So take a look, right? kind of start filtering out what makes most sense for you and your lifestyle. This is info about Puerto Morelos. Now, I am, if you are interested in Puerto Morelos, I'm happy to talk to you about Puerto Morelos. Um, I will tell you why I picked Puerto Morelos. I do this because I think it's helpful for people that might be interested in the area, but also because the factors that chose, that, that were deciding factors for me Maybe very different deciding factors for you, but I want you to kind of start this mental exercise of thinking about what works and what doesn't work for what you envision for yourself. Okay. I wanted to be, when we came to Puerto Morelos, we were looking for a destination to invest. And we were specifically wanting a destination that would have a high return for second home uh, developments. And we chose Puerto Morales. We chose it over Cabo San Lucas. We chose it over other areas of the Riviera Maya. We chose it over Costa Rica. We chose it over the Dominican Republic. We chose it over a lot of different um, destinations. Why? We felt that Puerto Morales set itself out to be the very, very best value for the money. And I still think that holds true today, and I'll tell you why. So we came from an investment perspective, but that investment perspective has a lot of things rolled into it that we'll talk about, okay? And this can be very appealing, even if you're not looking to be an investor or a developer. If you're looking um, to just buy your dream uh, retirement property, these are things that may very well attract you, okay? We are 15 minutes south of the Cancun airport. We just talked about how accessible that is. What does that mean? It means that we are the first stop on a beautiful coastline um, and we are easy to get to. So those people that wanna buy a place and be able to come down for long weekends, this works. They're not two hours, another two hours in the car or something from the airport or, or another hopper flight, right? Um, so that worked, it was easy to get to. It's easy to get out of. Um, I can spend a half day on the beach before I get on my afternoon flight, right? That's awesome. Um, it is the most authentic Mexican town on our coast. That is my personal observation. I think most people would agree with me. 
Puerto Morelos has been a fishing village for over 100 years. Certainly, if you were in the Riviera Maya, you are in a tourism destination. It has been affected by tourism without a doubt, okay? But that being said, it has the most authentic Mexican feel. I did. I wanted to move to Mexico and feel like I was living in Mexico. In Puerto Morelos, you feel like you're in Mexico. There are other destinations, and this is, you know, not one better than the other. It's just personal preference. Um, they don't. They they feel like you could be anywhere. They're kind of nondescript. And for me, that's not what I wanted. I wanted an authentic Mexican feel to where I was living. Uh, Mexi Puerto Morelos has a national park. We have the only marine park, national park in the entire country. Um, it's protecting what is the second largest barrier reef in the world. If you do not know this, the Mesoamerican Reef is 500 meters from Puerto Morelos' shore, and it is the second largest barrier reef in the world next to the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. That reef um, provides a lot of protection and so I could take, I can take my kids to when they were babies to the beach and not have the big waves, right? So if you're a surfer, this isn't really your, your, your place, right? Because that beach breaks the big, big surfing waves. You're going to want to look at something like Huatulco or something on the Pacific side that gets bigger wave action. Puerto Morelos is a protected cove. Um, it's not a cove. It's a protect. It's protected from that. Um, the the reef breaks the big waves, and so it's like taking your kids to the lake, which I loved. So for grandkids, for families, it makes a really really great beach. Because it's national park, those waters are also protected. So it's great for swimming, which I love. It's great for snorkeling, which I love. You know, Puerto Morelos. It's very. It's at its shallowest. The reef in Puerto Morelos. And so it's a mecca for snorkelers. Um, it's some of the, arguably the best snorkeling in this hemisphere. And so you can kayak, you can windsurf and kite surf, um, you can uh, swim. There is very, very controlled boat motor traffic to certain areas of the reef with permits only um, or a private boat only, but you have to anchor in certain spots not to affect the reef. They change those spots around to move the traffic around on the reef each year. Um, it creates a very tranquil beach environment. There are no jet skis and there are no parasails. And again, this is not judgment, but for me, a personal preference, I'd rather lay on a quiet beach. I don't wanna hear jet skis zipping around, right? If you do, there are lots of locations that have them and we can find you that place, okay? But these were what attracted me to Porto. Um, the mangroves behind Puerto Morales are protected and so that limits their development. What does this mean for a developer? This was very attractive for someone who lives there. It was very attractive. It means that there's a very small enclave of property available for small, low, des low density residential development. And for us, that meant an excellent investment, okay, potential. And so, and I would argue it remains the same. People live in Puerto Morelos and love living in Puerto Morelos. You're close to Cancun, you're close to close to Playa del Carmen, but the people that live in Puerto Morales would never want to live in those areas. Maybe go visit and then come home, okay? Um, so those, those are the main features that drew me to Puerto Morelos. I wanted a place that had a really nice mix of expats and locals. I didn't, like I said, I wanted to feel like I was in Mexico. I didn't want to feel like I was sitting in gringo land. Okay, and so I think there's a really, really good mix of locals and expats in Puerto Morelos, which I like. It's an active community. We have international fishing tournaments and different types of festivals, and we have a really active Casa de la Cultura. Casa de la Cultura is a house of culture, and the idea behind those is it's a community center, and it's, it's um, nonprofit, no government assistance whatsoever. It's run by the communities. People offer classes at a very accessible um, price for everybody to be able to participate. You can take classes in our Casa de la Cultura in arts and music and exercise and martial arts and languages. And I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Really great group. And in Puerto Morelos, they're very, very active. We're so fortunate. We have charity work going on. There are golf courses if you like to golf. We have book clubs that happen and knitting clubs and you just, you name it, right? People are getting together. So <clears throat> I like that. Um, Language is not a particular obstacle. We'll talk about this a little bit more, but if you don't speak Spanish at first, you can get by with speaking some English. Uh, you know, there are enough tourists in our area that a lot of people do speak English. We'll jump into that a little bit more, but don't feel like you can't move because you, ha you aren't speaking Spanish yet. It'll come. The other thing that I can say now, which I couldn't necessarily say when I first moved there, is Mexico is not a big leap anymore. 
you know, in this area of Mexico, we have Costco and Sam's Club and Walmart and Home Depot. Um, you have supplies available to you. You might not have every brand that you're used to buying at home, um, but it is not a great leap to move like maybe it was in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, and you're also, you know, as I mentioned, you're right between Cancun and Playa del Carmen, um, some of the best restaurants in the world, frankly, and all of the venues that that um, are available. Obviously, the beach brought me to Puerto Morelos. It's fantastic. Like I said, it's crust she shell, she, seashell, so it does not get hot. You can walk on it in your bare feet any time of day, which is pretty cool. I love the Mayan culture and the Mayan ruins. I like traveling to those different things and learning about them. So this area really attracted me because of that availability. If you're a golfer, tons of golf courses in this area. Um, I like the snorkeling and the kayaking. Um, if you're a diver, there's diving in the area as well. Certainly the boating and fishing is great. We have good uh, ocean fishing. Uh, we also have fly-in uh, spinfish areas that are not far from Puerto Morelos. And I'm a foodie. Puerto Morelos has great little restaurants in town. And if you want to get out and go to Playa del Carmen or Cancun for dinner, you certainly can, but you don't have to. It's fantastic. So those are all things that I like about Porto. Um, I. I'm obviously, you know, after doing my research, that's what drew me to there. Use that information as you will. And um, and I, like I said, I really hope it was just kind of an exercise to jog, kind of making your important list and figuring out which locations sort of fit that, um, the deal that you're looking for, right? Um, for me, one of the big points was the weather. I'm not a cold weather person and the weather in Cancun is pretty dang nice. This is weather um, by month, the average high and the average low in Celsius and in Fahrenheit. Um, it's beautiful, beautiful weather year round. Basically um, warm during the day year round and it, the difference is in the summer, it's a little less, it cools down a little less at night. Uh, winters are just beautiful in Porto. They have nice cool nights and nice warm days. So. Um, it's a great place to live weather-wise, hard to beat. I get what is cost of living. I don't mean to cheat this question, so I apologize. Um, this is such a hard question to answer, okay? Um, why is it a hard question to answer? Because people live differently. Um, and, and costs of living in Mexico, just like everywhere else, are gonna vary depending on the area you're in. Probably not a surprise after we've talked about our area because of its accessibility, because of all the benefits that it has, because of its popularity, it's one of the more expensive places to live in Mexico, okay? Um, in general, that being said, how does that compare to American and Canadian standards? Well, kind of depends on where you're from and it kind of depends on what you do. Um, and I'll, I'll give you some examples, okay? So real estate in Puerto Morelos, you can be a five to 10 minute drive to the beach in a nice little house for 50 or $60,000. That's certainly, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say less than a lot of markets, okay? To be five or 10 minutes to the beach. Um, if you're on the water, you can be in a several million dollar home. That may be over the average price of housing in your area. That may be under the average housing price in your area, especially if you're comparing oceanfront properties, right? So. This is where, um, hard to say, <laughs> but, um, but really, um, it's a good, it's a good exercise for you to do once you know how you live, how you want to live and where you want to live to understand your cost of living. Utilities in Mexico, I will tell you that most utilities are less than what I'm paying in the United States, except for electricity. Electricity can be expensive. Um, it goes by, um, the amount of use you have. So in the summer months when we're running electric, when we're running air conditioners a lot, your electricity is probably gonna be more expensive than what you might've paid in the United States. Um, groceries, again, it depends on how you eat. I love fruits and vegetables. Mexico has beautiful fruits and vegetables that are way less expensive than what you pay for them in the United States. Um, if you eat a lot of processed foods and stuff that's been imported, that can be a pretty expensive grocery bill. So, um, 
again, depending on how you eat will depend on your grocery bill. But I think most people find that their groceries are significantly less expensive in Mexico. Uh, school, my tuition, again, there's a range of what people pay for private schooling uh, in the United States or in Canada. So it's hard to say without a doubt, but you know, I think the, pri the private school and the quality comparison, um, it was a very, very good school paying significantly less, probably a third of what I would have paid for that education in the United States for my kids. Um, medical insurance, less expensive for sure, because I'm a US citizen and medical insurance can be very expensive. If you're Canadian, you have higher income taxes, but technically you don't pay out of pocket for medical insurance. So um, that could vary. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Um, car insurance was less for me to insure a vehicle in Mexico than it was in the US. Fuel was more per liter and house insurance was less. Although I live in an area where I need to have hurricane insurance. So actually I, I might pay a little more for my house insurance um, in Mexico than I do at home, but it's because I have a pretty substantial hurricane coverage. So um, something to think about. Overall, you know, I can tell you that the way I live, I have a vehicle, I have a home. Um, my house costs about the same, but I'm two blocks to the water. I'm not two blocks to the water at home. Uh, my utilities are all less except my electricity. My electricity is a little bit more, but my property taxes are way less. Uh, groceries, I spend less. School, I spend less. Medical insurance, I spend less. Car insurance, I spend less. The actual cost of buying a car, about the same. Fuel. Uh, more per gallon and then house insurance about the same really because I have the hurricane policy. So overall I live in what's considered one of the most expensive areas in Mexico and my cost of living are less than what I had at home even in the most expensive areas but it really depends on where you live and how you live and how much staff you have at the house and you know if you live like a king your costs are going to be more than um, what the king or queen, I guess in my case, your costs are going to be more expensive, but probably comparatively to the staff prices of what you would have in the US or Canada, it's going to be less. So again, um, really take a look at it. But overall, I think you're going to find your cost of living are going to be less. Local bloggers are a really good source of information. Tune into the local bloggers in the areas when you start defining where you're going to be interested in, and they can really go through that. Talk to a real estate agent, find out about what you can rent long-term rent price for um, and if long-term are available in your area you know with the Airbnb thing like a lot of communities a lot of houses have went to nightly rentals and there aren't very many long-terms available so this is also something to consider okay let's jump to a different topic visas so people say do I need a special visa if I want to live in Mexico again my answer is going to be maybe Okay, let's go through it. We'll talk about why you would want a visa or why you might just want to come as a tourist. So let's talk about this. There are two different types of visas. You can come as a tourist or you can come in as a resident. All right, now I want to make the distinction. If you are a Mexican resident, that doesn't mean you're a Mexican citizen. Totally different. Okay, so don't confuse citizenship and equate citizenship with residency, it's not. If you're a US citizen, it'd be like, um, or if you live in the US, it's like the difference of a US citizen and somebody who has their green card, right? They're an immigrant, a permanent immigrant. Um, this is the distinction, okay? So in Mexico, we're not gonna talk about getting your Mexican citizenship. You can obviously do that, but we're gonna talk about the most common forms that people use. They either come as a tourist or they come as a resident, okay? What are the differences and what are the, the benefits of both? All right, so let's talk about this. I'm assuming that you guys, if you are on this webinar, you have been to Mexico, this is not your first rodeo. You guys recognize this form. You're given this on the plane on the way down, or if your plane didn't have one, you got stuck in a line filling it out. You fill out the top section, they rip it in half, they give you a certain amount of days that you're authorized to stay down here, and they give this to you and they don't say another word and you go and you get your luggage. If you did not learn the hard way the first time, you know that when you go back to the airport to leave, they ask you for this piece of paper that they've absolutely mentioned nothing about. It's a very important piece of paper. This is your tourist visa. 
This is what shows you entered the country legally and you didn't, you know, jump the border. And I think they should do a better job of explaining that to people because a lot of people go, thanks, and like it's a receipt and throw it away. And they go to leave and they don't have it to go. Um, they got to buy another one. So don't lose this. This is your official document to show you entered the country legally and you want to keep this with you during your stay. The important thing to note is you can come in and out on this tourist visa and you can stay in Mexico up to 180 days. Okay, so if you're going to come down and let's say you just want to kind of snowbird and you're looking at renting for a couple of months in the wintertime and then you're going to go back, you don't necessarily have a problem coming in and staying those couple of months just as a tourist. Okay, not a problem. You might run into a problem, however, if you're actually living in Mexico full time and you're staying the full 180 days, you're leaving, you're coming back in a couple of days later or a day later. You're staying a full 180 days, you're going out of the country to just renew it, coming right back. And essentially, when Mexico starts to see that you're actually living in the country, they may refuse you entry as a tourist and say, no, you're actually living here and you need to go get your resident visa. OK, and they're becoming more particular about that. So just be aware that that may happen if that's sort of what you the pattern you've fallen into. Um, Mexico is getting more particular about that and trying to get those people to get their resident visas instead of using the tourist visa when really it's meant for tourists. So again, if you're going to come in, you're going to stay up, you're planning to stay less than 180 days, you're welcome to come in on just a tourist visa. Why would you get a resident visa? Okay, so the next step is as well, if I, you know, that's how I come in as a tourist and it kind of limits how long I can stay. Does it limit what I can do? Well, it does, okay? So why would you go and you'd make the step to get a residency visa? Again, we're not talking about Mexican citizenship, we're talking about residency, which is like the equivalent of your green card in the US, okay? Why would you go do that? Well, the moral of the story is, if you go get this visa, okay, a resident visa, it lets you get two different numbers. It lets you get a CURP, C-U-R-P, and it lets you get an RFC, Okay, these are two ID numbers. This is a social ID number and this is a tax ID number. They actually have two different numbers in the US. In the US, we use basically our social security number for both. I don't know about Canada, um, but in Mexico, they have two different numbers. One is a social number and one is a tax number. So this is more used in social circumstances. This is more used for taxes. It allows you to get both of those. Tourists that come in on a tourist visa cannot get those numbers, okay? And really at the heart of it, these numbers are required for different things that you may need if you're planning to live in Mexico. First of all, it lets you stay. So remember that we talked about as a tourist, you can stay up to 180 days before you have to leave the country. As a resident, you can stay indefinitely. Now, as a resident, it doesn't say that you have to spend a majority of time in Mexico. In fact, you can have your resident visa and spend two or three weeks in Mexico a year. The amount of time that you spend in one place versus another is not tracked in Mexico. They don't really care, okay? So don't feel like because you come down for three or four months a year only, but you need some other things, with these numbers for other things, go ahead and get your visa, okay? But it does allow you to stay longer than 180 days if you'd like to do that. You're not limited. You can stay indefinitely. Uh, it lets you open a bank account. Okay? So even if you're only in Mexico three or four months a year, but you want a bank account, you need to go get a resident visa. Okay? Because you're, ultimately, you're going to need the CURP and the RFC numbers in order to open this bank account. As a side perk, you get a lot of local discounts. So if you go to any of the tourist attractions or a lot of the restaurants or play golf, a lot of times they will have a special price for people that are locals. And so getting that um, allows you to do that, right? If you wanna get a job and work in Mexico, you're gonna need tax ID numbers, right? And a social ID number. So you're gonna have to get that uh, visa. If you wanna own a business, same thing. You're gonna need your resident visa. If you want, now you can buy a car, but you can't register it. <laughs> if you want to register a car in Mexico, you're going to need uh, to have a visa. If you want a driver's license in Mexico, you're going to need a visa. If you want your senior card, student scout card, you're going to need a visa. If you need to file income taxes because you're working in Mexico or you have a home and you're collecting rental income and you're paying those taxes, 
you know, if you need a tax ID number because you need to pay taxes, you're going to need a visa. If you want to enroll your kids in school while you're in Mexico, they're going to need visas. If you want to enroll in the public health insurance option that's available in Mexico, which we'll talk about more in a little bit, you're going to need your resident visa. The other thing is, is you don't necessarily need a residency visa to buy. You can come in on that tourist visa and buy a piece of property. That's not a problem. Okay. But once you buy, we highly recommend that you go ahead and you work toward permanent resident status. Why? Because it affords you certain tax benefits when you sell on the capital gains that's assessed on that property. So that's another benefit to visa holders. Okay, so let's just step back and make sure I've got everybody. You have tourist visas and you have resident visas, right? Tourist visas are for people that are just going to be here short term. They don't get those two numbers, the corp and the RFC, so they don't get to do all those things. They're just here as tourists, okay? You can come, you can rent a car, you can stay, you can use the ATMs to get your money out for a week, a month, however long you're here, up to 180 days, and then you go. The residency visa gives you those two numbers which allow you to really enter a lot of the fiscal, banking, and social systems in Mexico, which are probably going to be helpful if you're living here for any amount of time. Okay. Now, if you go to get a residency visa, there are two types. There's a temporary resident visa and there's a permanent resident visa. Both of those have no time limit on your stay, so you can stay longer than 180 days for as long as you like. Okay. And both of them um, also don't dictate that you have to be in Mexico for a certain period of time. So whether you're a temporary or a permanent resident, you don't have to be in Mexico for any minimum amount of time. You can come and go as you please, okay? But it does allow you to have those two numbers, which are very important for all the things that we talked about. Now, whether your temporary resident status or whether your permanent resident status, if you have a temporary resident visa, you can be authorized to work on that visa, okay, which would let you have your own company or work for another company, or you specifically are not authorized to work. And what does that mean? It means you can't collect income while you're in Mexico. You're retired, right, or not working. Um, so if you want to work in Mexico, you're going to need your work authorization on your visa. The temporary requires renewal, all right, so you have to renew that. Um, once you move to permanent status, you no longer have to renew it, but you still need to be authorized to work. Okay, so if you're going to work in Mexico, regardless of whether you're a temporary resident or you're a permanent resident, you do need authorization to do that. All right, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on visas. We actually, I'll talk about it in a minute. We have a webinar on this, but just know that most people start out as a temporary and after four years move to a permanent resident visa. That's the typical path for people. Okay. You still use this form, all right, but you don't check that you're a tourist anymore and you actually grab this form on your way out. So when you're at the Cancun airport or whatever your local airport is, you're going to pick this up on your way out. You're going to give this to them on the way, or sorry, give the bottom portion to them on the way out and keep this part in your passport while you're traveling back to your home country or wherever you're going and give this back when you come back into the country. Again, um, I don't want to get too far in the weeds on visas, okay, but I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of whether you need one or not. If you've decided that you probably are going to want a visa, then what I suggest you do is you take uh, our webinar about visas. We have, it's called obtaining a temporary or, uh, sorry, attaining a Mexican temporary or permanent resident visa. We did this webinar with Millie Arceo, who's an immigration specialist in Playa del Carmen. She owns legallyinmexico.com. And that goes through the whole process, okay? The one thing you want to know is the vast majority of visas, that process begins in your home country. So whether you want to work in Mexico or whether you're coming to retire, whatever it is, you're going to start your visa process at the consulate in your home, your local consulate in your home country. You're not going to get to Mexico and start that process. You're doing, you start that process back at home, that consulate pre-approves you, and then you come down to Mexico to finish the process. Okay. Beyond that, I suggest you check, check out that webinar and we walk through how those work. Okay. Bank accounts. We've already talked about it. You definitely need a bank. Can you have a bank account? The answer is yes, but you do need a visa, right? A resident visa in order to have that uh, RFC number. Um, just as a note, 
There are some exchange houses which aren't retail banks. They're not, you know, um, the insured bank accounts. Um, but some exchange houses will let you have accounts with them on a tourist visa. Um, I've, I understand. But by and large, if you want a bank, um, you're going to need to get a visa. People, how are you going to get money in Mexico? Okay, if you're not working in Mexico, then theoretically you've got money coming in from somewhere else, a pension, whatever. So if you move to Mexico or if you're renting long term, you've got to figure out a way to get money from point A to point B. If you're working in Mexico, well, then you're probably earning pesos and you're going to have Mexican bank accounts and that's where the money goes and that's pretty straightforward. Um, I will tell you that people do a variety of things. There are some people who live here short term, you know, maybe they just winter here a couple months a year. They come on a tourist visa. They don't need bank accounts. So they just use their ATM cards and they pull out money at the ATM and that works, right? That's fine. Uh, people that live here long term, you're probably, or longer term, you're probably going to want a bank account, right? Um, one of the good things about a bank account is you can take advantage of exchange rates. So right now the exchange rate is very favorable if you have U.S. dollars or Canadian um, dollars to turning it into pesos. So you can take advantage of those times and get some money in your account and kind of top up when exchange rates are good. Um, the other thing is, is that it'll let you draw out larger amounts than what you can draw out of an ATM. And you don't have to carry as much cash around with you, which is also nice. So expats find a variety of things. And I will tell you that this list is organic and kind of changes as new things come out. All right. The good old standard is you set it up so you can do a bank transfer from your home bank to your Mexican bank and make sure you've done it so that you can do it online or you can do it via a phone system, not go into your bank to do it, right? Set that up. That's probably the most expensive way to do it because banks charge, most banks charge quite a bit of money to do an international transfer, especially if you're doing them often, okay? Um, ATMs, you know, depending on what your banks charge, you also don't want to get rang up on ATM fees either. So take a look at that. Uh, there are new apps that have come out on phones that will do this. Some people use one called Zoom, Z-X-O-O-M. Uh, Other people, a lot of my clients are using this app called Wise Transfer. Um, it basically does bank transfers for you, wire transfers, but for a lower cost than what banks do it. I understand that if you have Schwab investment accounts, um, I was reading that there are some benefits for expats that way, that they waive a lot of fees. So if that works for you, that might be something you want to check out. And the other thing you want to make sure is you want to make sure your credit cards don't charge any foreign transaction fees. I know the Chase Venture card doesn't. There's some American Express cards that don't. Those foreign transaction fees can really rack up if you're using them um, consistently in a foreign country. So you just want to think about your banking situation and how that's going to work for you. But those are some options. Okay. People say, hey, I want to work in Mexico. You have like the best job. How do you work in Mexico? Well, you have two options. The first option is, is that you open up your own Mexican corporation and you get a visa to work that corporation. I will tell you that Mexico is ripe for opportunity for entrepreneurs. I highly encourage you to do it. It can, it is not all peaches and cream. There is certainly all of this frustrations you would expect working in a developing country, right? But if it is not for the faint of heart, but it is certainly rewarding and I've enjoyed doing it. Okay. And it's very possible. So that's one option. The second option is, is that you go to work for somebody else. And if you do that, that company has to be authorized to hire a foreigner for that position. And once they are authorized, they can offer you that position and you take that formal job offer to your local consulate and say, look, I have a formal job offer waiting for me from this country who's been authorized to offer this to me. And they will give you a working, typically a working temporary, sorry, ter typically a working temporary visa um, to get you down here to start work. Okay. Um, but the Mexican employer has to demonstrate that it's a position that a f average Mexican worker can't do. And I will tell you that, you know, old school, it used to be that we could hire anybody that was a foreigner just because they spoke English, right? Because English was not a skill that a common Mexican for uh, Mexican employee had. Now it is. Now it's harder 
to hire somebody as a foreigner just because they speak English. Typically, um, you do not have any issues being hired if you have some sort of skill and you're working in that skill. So you're a certified dive master and you're being hired by a dive company. You are um, a certified yoga instructor and you are being hired by a um, yoga house. What are, I don't even know what those are called. Whatever, yoga place. Um, you are a certified massage therapist and you are being hired by a spa that type of thing you are a um, you have a science or a business you know a science degree and you're getting hired in some sort of science related industry you have a mba or a business degree and you're being hired by a hotel those are not those are okay you're you have education beyond the average mexican you're being hired as a specialty in that field and those positions are very very um doable okay People ask, this is one thing that, um, this is one thing that I talk about until I'm just tired of talking about it, but I think it's important to talk about. So here we go. How do you have a car in Mexico? Well, let's go back to what kind of visa do you have? Okay. Remember that there are, there's a tourist visa and then there are two types of residency visas, temporary and permanent. Whichever one you are will dictate what the options you have available for you um, for vehicles, okay? So let's start out with a tourist. Remember, you're a tourist. You have no obligations to Mexico. You've come in, you've grabbed the form, and you can be here for up to 180 days, right? What can you do? You can rent a car, okay? So you can go, you can fly into wherever you want to go, pick up a rental car at the airport. You don't need a Mexican driver's license. You can drive it with the driver's license of your home country and you can just rent a car. The other thing you can do if you want is you can drive across the border. So if you're an American or Canadian and you have a US car or you're Canadian with a Canadian plated car and you wanna drive it across the Mexican border, it's a little more involved. You have to have insurance once you cross and things like that, but you can take your car across the border and you can drive it around while you're there for up to 180 days, but then you have to drive it back out of the country from whence you came, right? So you have those options to you as a tourist. Now, this really is focusing on people that wanna live in Mexico. So if you wanna live in Mexico, you're either gonna have probably a temporary resident visa or a permanent resident visa, okay? Let's start with temporary residents. Temporary residents, you can still drive with your home's uh, country's driver's license. So if you're from the US and you have a you know, Michigan driver's license, you can use that. Um, because you have your corp and RFC numbers, you can also go and get a Mexican driver's license. All right. And I think it's a good idea actually to do because you can use it to show you're a local at a lot of different places. So, um, go ahead and get your Mexican driver's license. What are your options for a car? You can always rent a car, no matter what status you are, tourist, permanent, temporary, you can always rent a car. So you can always pick up a car at a car rental. Okay. And there are plenty of people that do that. There are plenty of people that snowbird in, they're here for a month or two. Maybe they don't even rent a car for the whole time. Maybe they just come down, they're in a place with great public transportation. Um, they use taxis and buses. And if they need to rent a car for a day or two or whatever, a week, because they want to go somewhere, that's what they do. Okay, very doable. Um, you can drive in your car from the US or Canada. Now, I will tell you that that's legal to do. I will also tell you that from per vast personal experience and dealing with people who have done this, this is not my suggested route for a vehicle, okay? When you drive in your US vehicle or your Canadian vehicle, you cannot sell it to another foreigner or to another Mexican. You cannot sell it, period, while it's in Mexico. You, have, you commit to taking that car out of the country, whether it's running or not. So if something happens and it doesn't run, you're technically committed to put it on a boat and ship it back. That's crazy. Really and truly, those temporary import pit permits that they give to those cars are really designed for those tourists that want to come in, tool around, and drive back out. Or if you're a temporary resident and you come in, you stay a couple of months, and you drive back out because you're right at the border. If you are looking to drive down a car and drive it all the way down to Cancun and leave it there indefinitely, this is not a good plan. Okay? What 
you should do, and what I highly recommend you do, is you go buy a vehicle in Mexico. You can do that, right? You've got your visa, you've got your ID numbers, you can go and you can do that. You can use that car, you can sell that car, you can do whatever you like with it, and it is not a problem. I will say this once again for the kids in the back. Do not <laughs> import a vehicle that is has US or Canadian plates and leave it in Mexico as your full-time vehicle. I promise you, you will regret it. Do not do it. Buy a vehicle, okay? That is my sincere suggestion to you. It will save you a lot of headache. You know, the other thing before we kind of get into this, the other thing to note is if you do bring down a vehicle, if for some reason you are that tourist or if for some reason you are that person who just will not take my advice, make sure it is a not only make, but also a model that they sell in Mexico. Why? Because if they, you know, there might be like, for instance, there's a Ford dealer here. But there's a lot of models of Fords that they don't make in Mexico. And that means that when you need parts, your dealer could be waiting months for the parts. One other reason to not bring cars to Mexico, buy them here, right? Totally different world now. People used to do this all the time because there weren't a lot of dealerships in Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. We now have the NASFA Treaty. Um, Cancun or most destinations are chocker blocked full of dealerships. This is not a problem. There's plenty of vehicles. Go buy one here. I hope I've made my point. Um, the last one is permanent residence. When you get your permanent residency, things change a little bit for you. You have to have a Mexican driver's license. Your, uh, your home license from your home country is no longer valid in Mexico. So you need to get a Mexican driver's license. And you no longer have the option of driving that plated car in and temporarily importing it which is okay because you shouldn't have done it in the first place. So you have the options available to you of renting a car as always, or buying a car in Mexico, okay? And if you have a plated car because you brought it in as a temporary resident, guess what? You've got to drive it back out because that car is now illegal, okay? Can't drive it anymore. Again, don't do it. Everybody ends up going permanent. Just buy your car in Mexico if you need one. All right. Let's move on. Health insurance. This is a really, really important topic, and it's probably one of the most important topics. And oddly, I find that it is the least researched by people before they make the leap. So let me bring it to your attention. The good news is, is that no matter what your circumstance is, whether you're looking to come to Mexico and spend a couple of months, whether you're looking to spend six months, whether you're looking to live here year round, there are insurance options for you. Okay, and you just have to find what fits your needs the best. The bad news is, is that the insurance that you have in your home country likely is not the policy that's going to cover you. Okay, if you have Medicare, it doesn't cover you overseas. If you have Canadian health insurance, it doesn't cover you overseas. Okay, some private insurance companies have some coverage, but most people um, are going to need some set of supplemental insurance or different insurance, okay? And it really depends on your situation. It really depends on the amount of time you're spending in Mexico and the amount of time you're spending outside of Mexico, okay? But there are options, and let's kind of go through those. For the people that are spending the shortest amount of times in Mexico, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, up to sometimes six months, there are travel insurance policies. Those travel insurance policies are going to be catastrophic coverage. So they are not intended to be primary health care. Basically, you're traveling to Mexico for some short period of time, and your primary doctors are back in the States or back in Canada, wherever your home country is. This is really just covering you in case of emergency, okay? And those are what those policies do. If you live in Mexico full time, all right, then you have a couple of options. All right, several actually. You can do the public health insurance option. So Mexico's health insurance system is a two-tier system. They have a public health option that is available to everyone that has those ID numbers that I talked about. Um, you can purchase that insurance. If you're a retiree, you get that insurance as an employee, okay? So everybody has the public option available to them, whether it's through their employer or whether they purchase it at a very low cost. That public option, allows you to use the public facilities. There is also a private hospital system. 
The private hospital system is typically um, uh, for people that have private insurance policies that will cover uh, cover treatment in private hospitals. Okay. What's the difference? Um, wait times can be longer in the public option. Uh, the public option, especially if you need treatment for a cold and you want to go see the public doctor, uh, those waits can be hours waiting in a waiting room, okay, at a very busy uh, facility, sitting around with a bunch of sick people. Not my ideal situation. It's your only option. That's what it is. But the good news is that there's a lot of doctors that you can private pay very inexpensively. In Puerto Morelos, you can pay 55 pesos, you can pay 400 pesos to see a doctor. That's anywhere from $2.50 to $20 US dollars. Um, very affordable to go see a doctor and pay out of pocket. So the public, a lot of people pay out of pocket for um, basic services and rely on the public health insurance option in catastrophic situations. If you would prefer to be in the private health system and you can afford to be in the private health system, you have a couple of options. You can either buy insurance through a private Mexican company. Uh, there are Mexican health insurance companies that will sell you policies. Or you can buy, as an expat, you can buy what they call expat policies. I actually had one of these. Um, Aetna, a very large insurance company in the United States, has a policy called Aetna Global. And it is for expats. And you have to live in Mexico a majority of the time. Um, you can only be back in your home country for a certain number of weeks a year. But it covers you worldwide. And that policy is a little bit different because it covers you no matter where you travel full coverage. So if you want to go back to the States, if I wanted to go back to the States because I really like my doctor that has seen me for years, I can go back and get regular healthcare coverage. It's not just catastrophic coverage outside Mexico. I can do that. Um, Mexican policies might cover you in Mexico and may cover you outside of Mexico in case of catastrophe, or you might need a travel insurance policy like, you know, now you shoes on the other foot. So really the, the important thing to know is insurance is available. You need to look at your options and you need to make sure you're covered. Uh, things that you want to start asking questions, the questions you want to start asking, you know, what do you have at home and is that going to cover you abroad? Number one. Okay, start there and start asking, you know, am I covered? Will this insurance policy cover me for routine health care or just catastrophic coverage? So am I covered for emergencies? Um, do they exclude pre-existing conditions? Do I have emergency and medical evacuation coverage? This is something a lot of people like. This says, look, if something really hits the fan and they can get me stabilized, I they cover me to be medically evac'd back to my home country. Now, it doesn't mean you get to pick your ho your hospital of choice. They're going to medically evac you to the closest facility that will take you for what you have. In Cancun, that's typically being medically evac to Miami, okay? But that will cover that medical evacuation. Important for some people, if it's important for you, you wanna make sure you have that coverage. And no, hey, if I'm living full-time in Mexico and I have one of these in policies, am I covered outside the country if I want to travel back to Canada or I want to travel back to the States or I want to go to France? No, because if you're not, you're going to need to pick up a travel insurance policy for the time that you're away. Like we talked about, medical care, um, you know, direct pay for dentists, for eye doctors, for um basic medical doctor visits can be very inexpensive and a lot of people just pay those out of pocket. What you don't want to be stuck with is being completely uninsured in the case of an emergency or being a tourist without any kind of coverage um, in an emergency. You want to make sure you have some sort of, at the minimum, you want to make sure you have some sort of healthcare coverage that covers you for emergency, um, big hospitalization type things, okay? Um, because if you go into the hospital as a tourist with no coverage, that hospitalization can be very, very expensive. So make sure you are covered for catastrophic um, coverage at minimum. I'm going to tell you that the quality of care and the standards of care, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to um, give you the roses and tell you that in rural Mexico, you're going to have top of line health care, just like in any other country. Um, you know, health care, um, some of the best health care is in the bigger metropolitan areas. Right. And I don't think Mexico is any different than what you'd expect there. 
Um, Cancun, I can speak to Cancun because I live there. Cancun is a state-of-the-art medical facility. The Galenia Hospital meets U.S. and Canadian care standards. Um, these are the three logos. This is the Canadian standards. This is the United States standards, and this is the Mexican standards, just so you know those logos in case you want to look up hospitals in your area. Um, I can tell you that we have, you know, first-class hospitals in our area. That doesn't mean to say that, it, like I said, if you move to rural Mexico, that I could say the same. Um, really look at what medical services you have available uh, and where your health insurance will cover you, right? Because some insurances say, I'll cover you at these hospitals. So know which coverage you have. Do I need to speak Spanish? Okay, here's where I'm going to tell you. Yes, goodness. If you move to another country, learn to speak the language the best that you can, all right? It, your Spanish may never be perfect. And there is never a better way to learn a language than immersing yourself in it. But that being said, when you move to an area that has a bigger tourism population like the Riviera Maya, it is not an obstacle. Please don't keep, a, you, keep it, that be the factor that keeps you from moving. Um, you will be able to get by with some English and some help uh, until you speak Spanish. I will tell you that in tourist areas, a lot of times you're going to run into people that speak English. Where you're not going to see people that speak English are in the um, industries, you know, if you need to call a plumber or you need to call an electrician or your housekeeper or, you know, the stuff that happens in the back end. All the front end businesses that deal with the tourists, they're going to speak English. The back end stuff that deals with home ownership, not so much, right? Those guys aren't necessarily the ones speaking English. We're going to keep this brief. People ask me all the time, can I own property in Mexico as a foreigner? My answer is yes. It is not a lease. You can own it. Now, that's the very short version. There is a longer version about how you should own property and what things you need to do. Um, but yes, you absolutely can own property in Mexico. And if you're interested more in that topic, we have a webinar about that. It's called Buying in Mexico. Check out that webinar. Um, and uh, it goes through the entire buying process and how you buy in Mexico. If you're thinking about investing in Mexico, whether you know, you're talking about um, especially making a real estate investment, one of the interesting things is you, know, you have an investment portfolio and it's diversified if you've done the right things and you've got a little bit of stocks, you got a little bit in this, you got a little bit in that. But investing in a second home is a way that one, you can make an investment um, hopefully you're making a solid investment. We've talked about how Mexico is a very strong international market. It has a very, very strong market that is very resilient uh, for second homes. And we talk about that in the Buying in Mexico um, webinar. And so that's a portion of your savings and a portion of your investment that you can enjoy a margarita in the pool right? Which you can't do with a checking account. So it does offer some real benefits, um, real practical benefits while you're making an investment that is making you money. So um, I invite you to join us and we talk about that in the Buying in Mexico webinar. Really brief cost of ownership. Cost of ownership, like cost of living, are generally going to be less. Your taxes are going to be less um, and your overhead is going to be less. Uh, with the exception of your electricity, okay? Thank you so much for hanging with me through this webinar. I hope I've answered your questions. Couple of quick things before you go. Number one, this is a series, join us again. On our blog, portamorellosblog.com, you can go straight there, you can get to our blog from our website. You can subscribe. On the right-hand side, you can put in your email and we do not blog post much. Um, we will not inundate your inbox, but what we do is we send once a month our monthly lineup of any webinars that we're doing. So if you want to be in the loop on other uh, webinars that we do, please subscribe to that blog. We do some really good topics that um, foreigners in Mexico are, are, you know, are definitely interested in. This is our 2020 series. We just ask that if you have watched this webinar and you've enjoyed it, please share it. Take this link and put it in your local expat pages on Facebook or share it on Twitter, however, whatever social media you use, share it amongst your friends and family. That's the one thing we ask of you after um, taking our webinar, if you will, if, you'll, if you found it helpful to share the information. Word of mouth is um, how this webinar series um, is successful. 
And the last thing is, is here's my contact information. If you have any questions, it's my email. That's our website and our blog. If you go to our website and you want to see some of the other webinar recordings that have been made and not join us live, if you join us live, you have the opportunity to ask us questions, which is really nice. But if you want to see webinars that we've done, go to our website, Mind Riviera Properties, scroll down to the bottom of the page, and you'll see um, social media icons. One of those social media icons is YouTube. Click the YouTube link and that will pull up our YouTube channel. And the very first, um, we've divided it so that you can see them easily. It says MRP webinar series, and all of the videos are there. So um, that's a way you can access our other, um, our other webinars that we've done. I will tell you that there are webinars like we've talked about buying in Mexico. Uh, we talk about capital gains tax for people that own, We've done webinars on the visas, like we've mentioned. We also sat down with a US accountant in one and a Canadian accountant in a second one and talked about all the obligations that you have if you want to work in Mexico or own in Mexico or live in Mexico, all the tax obligations that you have with your home countries in the US or Canada. So that might be helpful too if you're thinking about, um, if you're thinking about uh, living abroad. So with that, I hope that I've answered all of your questions. If I haven't, you're welcome to contact me. Have a great day, and I look forward to working with you. If I can ever be of help in looking for property, either in Puerto Morelos or referring you to another agency that will take great care of you as a foreigner wherever you happen to be interested. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon.